sing these, these first couple songs this morning to remind you that they're singing in heaven right now. So let's share in that together. We're all worshiping the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you're able and you're willing, please stand, and we're going to sing some songs together to start this service.
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. What he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I know the author of tomorrow has ordered my steps. So this is my story. This is my song. Praising my risen King and Savior all the day. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. And I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never together I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered that's why I trust him that's why I trust him I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered i sought the lord and i heard and he answered that's why i trust him that's why i trust him i sought the lord and he heard and he answered i sought the lord and he heard and he answered i sought the lord and he heard and he answered that's why i trust him that's why I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. And I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never Trust in 
see you this morning. I know we've, uh, we've got some visitors here even this morning and just want to make sure uh, that you feel as welcome as possible. We, we do have a, a, a nice little welcome bag that we put together for you. So if you haven't gotten one of those yet, um, please, please, please head over toward the Welcome Center or see one of us on your way out. We want to get one of those to you. If you could, I know Ken will mention this again later, but please fill out one of these Connect cards for us. Uh, it's the only way uh, that we... Uh, Know officially that you're here and gives us a chance. We don't harass you or anything like that. Uh, we won't put you on the email list unless you check the box to be on the email list. But we would love to, to contact you and just, just check in with you, um, see if you have any questions about us or the church or things like that. And so if you've been here, I know some of you have been, been, been visiting a few weeks. And uh, so if you would fill it out, that would be, that would be awesome. Um, Last week was, was Easter, uh, as, as many of you know, and I wanted to just thank you for all of you that were with us through all of those services and, and different things that we did throughout the Easter week. Um, it was an incredible week, but the highlight of that week for me was at the end of the Easter service. Um, several people. We, we had the prayer room door open, and uh, for some reason that seemed more inviting. And so uh, several people actually made their way that direction, and we were able to pray with those folks and just know that we long to do that with you. Uh, that's part of what we want to do. We have an entire team of people watching that door, waiting to see people, if the people head that way, to meet you there and pray with you. And so don't miss that, that opportunity uh, each and every time that we gather, okay? Um, one other thing I wanted to mention here before we get rolling, and that is this. Um, some of us around here have decided that we wanted to do something. We, we talked about it probably about two months ago, a month and a half ago. Uh, Ken, David, and myself um, talked about this idea and last week, we finally were able to actually put it into motion, and we look forward this week to uh, recording more. We've started, uh, there's this brand new invention. It's called a podcast. If any of you have ever heard of that or not. Um, yeah, they're becoming wildly popular, we hear. Anyway, so, so we decided that uh, we wanted to start one. It's, it's very simple. That's a picture of, of us together. We're still working on the graphics and things like that. It's an experimental project. But three guys in a Bible. Uh, because here's the thing. Uh, none of us are pastors by trade. We're, we're all just folks. I was a school teacher. Ken was a lot of things. Um, and <laughs> I wasn't being mean. That's true, yes? I couldn't list all the jobs Ken's had, all right? Uh, and, and David's been a musician, uh, his, basically his entire life. And so uh, us three sitting around talking about Scripture, talking about Bible topics, talking, reflecting even on Sunday morning sermon or whatever might be coming up or even in culture uh, are things that we're going to do. And so we're going to kind of keep them brief. We're not going to, it's not going to be the hour and a half. Those long format podcast listeners, how many of you are those? Who's the long format? You like, you want the hour, hour and a half thing, yeah. And then you're stuck on the series of murder mystery stuff and all that. You know who I'm talking to. Don't pretend. Okay, so this won't be that, all right? This won't be that. Uh, none of us could, could talk for that long. Anyway, so um, anyway, the first episode's out. We're going to continue to work on it. We would love to have you subscribe to that. Our goal is to right away get to 100 and then see what God can do from there as uh, then it gets, gets promoted. We'll send an email link out tomorrow. We did a soft launch last week, and we know several of you found us on Facebook and subscribed that way, but it'll be fun. Uh, something a little different, no, a new way to interact with us. Don't be surprised for the time when we say, hey, give us, give us a question, give us a topic, give us something to talk about, and then uh, we'll, we'll do that. So that'll be fun as well. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to that, all right? Before we dive into the, the meat of today, um, tomorrow, some of you might be aware, the sun's going to disappear for four minutes, right? Uh, none of you have ever experienced this before, unless you're 100 years old, um, or you lived somewhere else and experienced a full solar eclipse, and none of you will experience it again unless you move. So it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing, regardless of all the hype and hysteria. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing in our universe that our God created, and it's fascinating. 
It's genuinely, truly fascinating that something 400 times larger than the little bitty moon that we have just disappears behind the little bitty moon. It's crazy. Because the moon is 400 times closer than the sun, it can play that little game with us. You you can take 63 million of our moons and fill the sun with them. But yet for four minutes, we can make the whole thing just disappear. It's, it's incredible. And one of the things that, that I think about is, what did people think 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, when all of their existence based around this light in the sky just would disappear? They had no idea how to deal with that, what, what, what to do. Was it coming back? They didn't know. <laughs> they really didn't. I, I, I did a little reading just because I think it's fun. Uh, The ancient Chinese culture, uh, if you're familiar with Chinese culture, they have this thing with dragons. A dragon was eating the sun. That, that That was their interpretation of it. There was another warrior society that when that would begin to happen, their warriors would begin firing arrows at the moon. And wouldn't you know, the sun would come back. So guess what? It must have worked. Yeah, we don't, we don't think about these things because we live in a, a society where this has been in the news for, what, four or five years now that this was coming because we can predict these things, right? They couldn't do that then. Just know our God is fascinating, and He loves to mess with us and have fun with us. And hey, watch this. <laughs> this is the silliest thing, and you guys are going to flock to watch it. This is nothing, but it's fun, so you guys enjoy it. It's just so cool. That's our God. Okay, have fun with it. Enjoy it. Embrace it. Don't, don't, you know, what, maybe the world does end tomorrow. Yay! Right? No election, no more political commercials, right? Yay! See? A good thing, a good thing. And if it doesn't, a great thing because we have more time to spread the gospel and get more people to come with us to join eternity in heaven. So just embrace the moment. We got to think about life that way. Okay, we have to. We, We just have to. Let's pray. And then we'll dive into God's Word. Father God, we are so thankful to be here this morning. This is something I know I do not take for granted, even though it's something that's been a part of my life, my entire existence. This gathering together of God's people is such a special moment. May none of us ever treat it as just another thing we do, but instead let us long for the moments where we can gather together and celebrate who you are, where we can gather together and worship, gather together and learn, gather together to pray, gather together to be challenged by your word. Father, we must, we must, we must make this a holy event, something set apart in our lives, something special that you ask us to do. Because you know how much we need it. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, I, did, I, 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 do. I'm, I'm a, I do research. I try to find these things. I looked as hard as I could through the records, and I could not find the actual date and time and which committee it was. But supposedly, in the 1960s, there was an expert, <laughs> expert testimony. Hmm. Yes, in the United States Senate, of all places, Right? And this expert testimony was based on time management. Now, I could find some of the research about time management in the 60s, but I couldn't find this specific study, just to let you know. I looked and looked and looked and could not find it. This is just an example that I came across. The essence of the testimony was this. It said, and I quote, because of advances in technology, 1960s, within 20 years or so, they projected that people would have to radically cut back the number of hours that they worked per week how many weeks they worked per year, or else they would have to retire sooner. The challenge they said was that people, what would people in the 1990s do with all of their free time? Now, this is 2024, and that clearly is our biggest problem, right? What am I going to do with all of this free time that I have? Hmm. Most people would contend that we're busier than ever. Now, sure, we find three to eight hours every single day to look at that device that we have in our pockets, but, you know, we don't have free time. And dare I say we have any time to rest. There's no way for that. I'm going to conduct a little survey amongst you here, so I need some crowd participation, okay? I need you to raise your hand right now. Raise your hand high, and I've already talked to a bunch of you, so don't lie, because I'll know you're lying. Raise your hand high if you are 
tired this morning. Just be honest. Raise your hand if you are tired this morning. Hmm. Wait, wait, yeah, keep them up. According to the CDC, this is most recent research, it says that 13.5% of adults, 13.5% of adults feel tired or exhausted most days. So I'm looking around the room. That should be between 20 and 35 of you. I think we've exceeded the average. Keep your hands up. You're overachievers. Good job. I know. Keep them up just a little longer. Isn't it funny? I'm having the tired people. Keep their hands up. Anyway, um, it's just what I like to, I need you to keep it up because I got another part of the survey. I need to see, are there more males or females with their hands up? So I'm, I'm studying the crowd to see, are there more males or females? Our crowd is pretty divided. It's pretty even. The, you can put your hands down. Now. The, the research says that actually um, females are more likely to be tired than males. Our crowd was pretty split. But here is the most fascinating thing, and this does hold to be true because I, I, I know a lot about many of you. Um, this is an odd statistic. The number of people that are tired decreased with age. By nearly 50% among females, from 20% of 18 to 44-year-olds to only 11% of those over 65. Interesting. Wouldn't you think it would be the old people that are the ones that are tired? Yet. There you go. (laughs) Yeah. Here's the thing. We just did our own. We were closer to 50% of the crowd being tired. How is that possible? You have all this free time, people. Why are you so tired? It's interesting. I did another quick study. I actually um, tried to prove my research because I do this study every Sunday morning as I talk to people, in particular as I talk to teenagers. I always say, hey, how you doing? And you know what their answer always is? I'm tired. Today, that wasn't true. It was only about 50. Usually, it's 100%. Everybody from my son all the way through, it's 100%. Everybody says, I'm tired. When I, when I talked to them. Today, did they, not, they did not do that. I don't know if they knew the message today. I don't, I'm not sure what happened, but it was only about 50% today because I even questioned one specific individual who only ever says, I'm tired. I said, you didn't say you were tired. Well, I'm not. I'm, okay, good. I'm glad for you. But anyway, it's interesting how that works. I didn't want to leave that segment of our population out. With everything that's happening all around us, and there are a few things going on, With our work weeks being longer, whether they're actually hours we're supposed to work or not, it still happens. Our schedule being busier, especially if we have children. Our sleep. I I talked to two individuals today that are having trouble with sleeping. Our sleep being less restful. Our minds being constantly engaged with something. Something usually media-related, our bodies being way overstimulated in any number of ways. It seems like just maybe, just maybe in our culture, many of us need a little extra rest. Maybe, just maybe, we need to set aside a time to just disengage from the normal routine. A time to focus on just maybe one or a couple of important things in our life. A time set aside not to work, not to run our kids all over creation. A time to spend a little extra time, moment or two in prayer. A time set aside to take on a little bit more of God's word. Maybe even a time set aside to worship Him and Him alone. A little extra time with our family, our kids, not on the run, but just focused on one another. Wouldn't it be great if we could work that into our daily lives? What if I suggested to you that maybe, just maybe, there was a model for just such a life? What if maybe some supernatural being put into motion a plan? A plan that wanted man to take a day off, one out of every seven. A day off to focus on him. A day to rejuvenate our bodies. A day to reunite with family. A day to worship and grow closer to him. What if we human beings were actually designed, put together for a pattern like that in our life? What if we human beings all of a sudden thought we knew better 
and took a different approach to life, what do you think would be the result? <laughs> oh, maybe everyone would be tired all of the time. Huh. I wonder. I wonder. Not only are we unhappy, tired, <laughs> and unhealthy, do you think somehow, some way, those things could be related? Do you think there's some correlation between our collective unhappiness as a society, our collective tiredness as a society, and our failure to follow God's plan that He alone put in place for us? You see, God knows us. <laughs> he more than knows us. He actually created us. He knows every detail of the human body. He precisely planned it all out as our creator. And if we desire for this body to work the way that it should, then we have to have all of its components in alignment. Even the secular world knows that there's a connection between mind, body, and spirit. Now, they do not have an accurate understanding of what the spiritual realm truly is, but they definitely are on to something. They know it's all connected. Our being is interconnected by design of our Creator. First and foremost, we were designed to be connected to Him. We've used this passage many times, John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you will do nothing. Apart from me, you'll be tired. You'll be unhappy. You'll probably be lonely, depressed, anxious, and on and on it goes. Now, some of you might say, but pastor, that's not what Jesus said. How can you possibly make that transition from those things to what Jesus said? Well, here's how I can do that. You've got to understand what Jesus is talking about. He says, you will bear much fruit. Ah, oh, what are those fruits? Shall we look at those in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22? Love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, those are the things that we produce when we are connected to Jesus. When we're not connected to Jesus, oh, we still produce. It's not that we do nothing. It's that we do nothing good. We still produce fruit. It's the fruit of the world, the exact opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. Hate, sadness, anxiety, worry, impatience, cruelty, evil, Lack of faith, harshness, self-indulgence. Yes, those are the fruit of the world. God doesn't magically take those various things and those various experiences away. He replaces them. When we connect with Him, He's able to fulfill all of the needs that exist within our life, from love to belonging. He casts out fear and anxiety. He helps us find purpose and meaning. His love, His word, His law, His church, and the family found within will change your life. It has to. There's been lots of research done lately. You've probably seen some of those headlines that, that say just talking about people just attending religious services and how that alone helps increase their level of happiness, decrease their level of divorce and sickness, even heart disease and stroke, and that's just the bare surface participation. Imagine what's in store if you dive all the way in. Do you think that is a coincidence? Or do you think that our God, the creator of heaven and earth, and we talk about God in those big terms sometimes, but you must also remember that God is the creator of Chris and Ken and Mike and Darla, and I can go around the whole room and name you. He's your creator. Do you think he designed you to need this in your life? Absolutely, he did. One specific component of God's plan that, our, that mankind has done a marvelous job of dismissing is, and even within the church, quite honestly, is, is, is the focus of our key verse for today. It's in the book of Mark, chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. Jesus said to them, the Pharisees, in Mark 2, 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. We'll come back there, so hold that verse once you find it. We'll be back to it here in a minute. From the very beginning of time, as we know it, God introduced the concept of rest. If you never thought about it, even in the perfect world that Adam and Eve existed in, a world where God and man walked and talked together in the garden, where even the work that man did 
was ordained and blessed by God. It was in perfect harmony with the universe around them. Even in that pain-free, disease-free, sin-free, stress-free world, rest was an absolute part of God's plan before what all we have today. God ordained it, and he gave us the perfect example. It began all the way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 2. By the seventh day, God had finished his work that he'd been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. God had completed all of creation these six days, days, creating all that we know out of absolutely nothing at all. And after he completed it all, he stopped and he rested, thus establishing the Sabbath. Now, I remember as a kid hearing this story, hearing that creation story and go, wow, man, God must have been tired, like creating ev- well, everything. That seems like a lot of work, doesn't it? I can think of the things you have to do that make you tired. That would definitely wear me out. That's a lot of work. No wonder he rested. But that's not the point at all. So if you've ever thought that or had that thought about God needing to rest, that is not our God because our God never rests as we know it. In Psalm 121, David tells us that our God does not sleep, he does not slumber. In Isaiah chapter 40, one of my favorite verses in the entire book of the Bible is contained within this chapter. It begins in verse 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. Here's the part for us. He gives us strength, strength to the weary, and increases the power of the weak. Even the youths grow tired and weary. The young men stumble and fall. But those whose hope is in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. You need a passage of encouragement in your life. This is a great one to find it in. No matter your age, no matter your physical condition, this is a passage to put your hope in because God will provide the strength you need. He will help you run and not grow weary. Not only does God never get tired, but he then can impart his strength to us. That's what this verse is all about, if we hope in him. So why does Genesis 2 say that he rested if he doesn't need rest? That is a great question. In order to understand this, you've got to go back to the very original language that was used here, the language of Hebrew that it was written down. It's a fun Hebrew word, yeishbat. Yeishbat. You can all say it. It's a fun, fun little word. It simply means to cease, to stop, to abstain, to not work. The cessation of labor, the termination of labor. In other words, God's creation was complete, so he stopped working on it. It was done. The end. It's from the root of that word that we get the Hebrew word Shabbat, now translated Sabbath. But that is not all that God did on that day. He didn't just rest. We focus on that, but he didn't just rest. He also blessed the seventh day. God blessed this day of the week, and he made it holy. That word holy means God set that day apart from everything else. The seventh day was set apart from the beginning of creation. Later on in humanity's life, God needed to remind his people of this. It's spelled out. Some of you might have heard that commandment, the fourth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. On six days you shall labor. Wait, no, I thought we were only supposed to work five. On six days you shall labor, but the seventh is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor daughter, nor male, nor female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. This is the only commandment that begins with the word remember. In other words, God already put this, ordained this into place a long, long time ago, and everyone had forgotten The example he gave them was through creation. He reminded them of this. Remember the Sabbath and set it apart from the rest of the days of your week. Now, if you're familiar with Jewish history, you know that the Jews took it a little further than what God had intended. 
They made the Sabbath something that God didn't want to happen. They, it became this legalistic burden to try to observe the Sabbath. If you didn't know, there were 39 categories of laws pertaining to the Sabbath day alone. And each one of those 39 categories had some additional rules, a list of rules, hundreds of things instructing you on how to do every single possible thing on the Sabbath the right way so you didn't get in trouble by breaking the Sabbath. And then Jesus comes along. And Jesus said, hey, um, this whole Sabbath thing, you kind of got it all wrong. And so he took everybody back to God's original intent for the Sabbath. You might say, well, this is the new covenant. We don't have to follow the law. Well, that's not true, so stop thinking that. But regardless of that, this isn't just the law. This is from creation. God has always said this is how it's to be, period, end of discussion. He was constantly, Jesus was constantly breaking down all these man-made obstacles that had taken away from God's design and all of the relationships with him. In fact, Today's key verse for Mark chapter 2 takes place during one of those very moments. Remember context, very important. I said keep your finger there in Mark 2 because we're going back to it. In the previous verses leading up to our core verse, Jesus and the disciples find themselves hungry on the Sabbath. And they were walking past a grain field, so they stopped to pick a few heads of grain. The Pharisees confront Jesus about this. Now, my question is this. They're walking outside of town near a field. There's grain. Are these Pharisees literally hiding in the grass? Gotcha! Is that what they're doing? Waiting? Because that's what they say. Hey, you, you broke the law on the Sabbath. What are your disciples doing? You're not allowed to do that. Gotcha. Why are your disciples doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath? And that's when Jesus gives them the answer, our core verse for today. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And Jesus broke that legalistic burden that man had paid, placed on the Sabbath day. And he returned it to be what it was intended to be, a gift. The Sabbath is a gift from God intended for his creation, humanity. The Sabbath was made for man. It is a literal gift of God. So by not honoring that gift, we are rejecting a gift that God has given us. Now, you might know that Jewish law, Jewish teaching is that the Sabbath is when? Saturday. It's actually 6 o'clock Friday evening to 6 o'clock Saturday evening, but it's Saturday for the most part. As Christians, we've chosen to observe the Sabbath on Sunday. That's very intentional. We do that to remember the resurrection of Jesus from the grave on Sunday. That's our simple reason for choosing Sunday. Paul kind of goes on to reinforce this idea of the Sabbath in Romans 14, 5. One person considers one day to be sacred and another, another, another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord. No amen to that. Anyway, um, it's right there. For they give thanks to the Lord. And whoever abstains, if you don't eat meat, that's fine too. See, it doesn't, doesn't matter. That's not the point. Does so to the Lord and gives thanks to him. Paul's reminding us, hey, it doesn't really matter what day. That's not it. Colossians, he does, goes further. He talks about specific festivals in Colossians 2.16. All of those Jewish festivals that they would celebrate. Don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or what festival you do or don't participate in or new moon celebration or Sabbath day. All of those things were just a shadow. They were pointing to Jesus. And here's what Jesus says. This reality is found only in him. In other words, it doesn't matter what day of the week per se your Sabbath is, that time with God. Your work schedule might not allow Sunday to be your Sabbath. Well, okay. All right, but how are you honoring that day to the Lord? It's not just about the day of the week. It's about honoring the Sabbath and receiving that gift that God gave us. Family, we need rest. We just do. We know scientifically that without it, we're more stressed, more depressed. Our immune systems are not as effective. We get sick, more sick more often than we should a lack of rest leads to all kinds of disease, even the big ones, like heart disease and cancer. It affects our emotional state. It leads to fear and doubt and defeat and despair. A lack of rest is yet another reason why everyone is always on edge. 
why everyone is so uptight all the time, ready to fly off the handle at the slightest little thing. In our culture, we have devalued rest, especially the rest that God planned for us. This culture has deceived us into believing that, well, busier is better, of course, that we can never have enough. But they've slipped in a new one, if you haven't noticed. Not only can you not have enough, but you can actually never be enough either. I'll just let you ponder that one. We were designed to have this rest, this rhythm as a daily part of our lives, a weekly part of our lives. But it is more than just sleep. The sleep is vital. It's vital to our existence. No matter how much we deny it, how much we argue about it, we need sleep. I've heard people say, hey, you know what? I'll sleep when I'm, well, good, because you're going to be dead sooner. <laughs> I'm just saying that's the truth. It's a very easy stat to prove. But there's more to the Sabbath than just rest. There's a gift that Jesus promises us. You see, when we follow his plans for our lives, which include the Sabbath, he promises us his peace. One of the ways that God reveals that peace to us is through our honoring of the Sabbath. We're going to combine a few passages here so you can put this whole picture together through the New Testament. This is a New Testament teaching, not an Old Testament teaching. It builds on the Old Testament teaching. It adds to the Old Testament teaching to clarify it. Paul in Philippians 4.4, several of you probably know this verse, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Well, Paul didn't live when we live. You're right. He was writing this from prison. Keep that in mind. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And when you do, the peace of God will transcend, that transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This should be a part of our daily life, yes, but this should be the focus of our Sabbath. You see, when we take time to stand before God and offer up our lives to Him, He promises us His peace will come. And when His peace comes, it will guard our hearts and our minds. Family, do our hearts and minds need guarded in these times? Absolutely. They are under constant attack from every direction. The world wants to overwhelm your mind. The world wants to crush your hope. The world wants to break your heart. And you and I, we have the absolute best defense possible just waiting on us if we'll go to God and receive it. The peace of God can be within us. It can guard our hearts and our minds. It will guard your heart and your mind. Do you want this in your life? Because I know I do. How do we get it? Great question. Matthew 11, Jesus says it here as well. Again, a very famous verse. Many people know it, but we don't know where to find the rest he promises. Jesus says in verse 28, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you my rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We must come to Him, lay our lives before Him, and this is what we in exchange, in exchange will receive. But truly, can you find rest when you're anxious? Have you ever tried to sleep? Those of you that deal with anxiety and things, sleep virtually impossible, Yes? just resting, just putting things down, almost impossible. Can we find rest when we're trying to carry all of the burdens of our lives all alone? Is rest even possible when we're battling all of the expectations that the world has placed upon us in whatever roles we play? How about the expectations we've placed upon ourselves? Is it possible to rest without forgiveness? Is it possible to find rest when we hold on to unresolved conflict and bitterness in our lives? You see, rest can only be found when we bring all of those things to the foot of the cross, when we carry them to Jesus. Now listen to the promise of Hebrews chapter 4. I love that this is in here because it makes it fully a New Testament concept. 
It begins by saying, therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands. You and I, God has promised us that we can have his rest if we let us then be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest. How? How do we do that? Praise God that we have an opportunity to enter into the rest, but how do we do that? Verse 9, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Did you know this was a promise to you, person of God? For anyone who enters in God's rest also, this is key for some of you, listen to this, rests from their works. Anyone who has entered in rests from their works, just as God did from His. So unless we think we're better than God and we don't need that rest, then this is a command for us to follow. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Family, we've got to remember the Sabbath. We've got to make it a priority in our lives. We've got to make it what God intended for us to make, the gift that he gave us. Our acts of attending worship, of praying, of Bible reading, those are awesome things, and those are God's gifts to us. We do not do those for his benefit. Those are all for us. Those are all gifts that God gave us as well. At the very end of the chapter you'll read, we're back in the Core 52 series, chapter 29. If you're new visiting with us and you do not have a book on a table right behind the sound booth, there's a stack of Core 52 books. Take one with you today. You can pick right up where we are. You don't have to read the other 28 chapters. Just start with 29. They're very short chapters. And near the end of chapter 29, the chapter on rest, Mark Moore writes these words, our practice of Sabbath is a gift we receive, resting from work, refreshing our souls, worshiping God with other believers, reconnecting with family and friends. This is the life God wants for you. This is his plan for our lives. We need to respect the plan God has for us and honor the Sabbath, the way he intends to. Father God, we all came in here, probably many of us thinking about what we needed to do next. That thing at work that didn't get done, that thing at home that needs completed, that activity we've got to go to next. We were distracted, and that's truthfully the work of Satan. He is a master of distraction. The tyranny of the now the urgency of the moment that we got to get this done, we have to do that, and we can't possibly find time or take time to rest. Yet, Father, that costs us dearly. It costs us in every element of our lives. Yes, our physical health. Yes, our relationships with one another, but most importantly in our connection with you. When we don't take time to observe the Sabbath, when we don't take time to rest and honor you the way we should, then we are disconnected from that vine. And oh, we produce fruit, absolutely, but it's the fruit of the world. And we find our hearts and our minds and our souls filled with these thoughts and these things that we don't want to be filled with. And we wonder why we have these thoughts and these actions and these feelings and why all this is happening all around us. And we we don't put together the pieces of the puzzle that you already put together for us. If, if any part of this rhythm gets out of order, it begins to mess with us. And so, Father, let us use a time like this, a moment like this, your words reminding us that the Sabbath is a gift. It's a gift from God that we get to enjoy. And we all all of us need to learn how to enjoy it better. If we will take that time to focus on you, it'll be really easy to learn. So, Father, let us do that today. And as invitation time opens and, and people 
respond to the Spirit moving within you. Maybe they just need to come and, and confess to you, apologize if you will. God, I'm sorry for putting all of these things ahead of you in my life. I'm sorry for not taking your word to heart and honoring the Sabbath, remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy, setting it apart as an adult, setting it apart for our families to show them the importance of rest of being together, of worshiping God and making that a priority, a commitment in our life. We must do that. For when we do, you promise us your peace. When we lay our lives before you, when we sacrifice other things and and come to honor things like the Sabbath, Father, there's a peace that we can experience that the world does not know. A joy that we can experience that the world does not know. And a protection that your Spirit provides. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your creation and your example of the Sabbath rest. It's in Jesus' name we pray. I don't know whether to take a chance on climbing the stairs or not. I think I'll not. (laughs) Some of you have probably heard this before. That's entirely possible because I wrote it 52 years ago. And it's called A Sermon in a Poem. Almighty God has been so good to me. He's promised me eternal life. And his word says it's free. It's true, the gift costs nothing. But when all the facts are weighed, salvation's only free because the price by Christ was paid. When someone offers you a gift, there are things that you must do. You must reach out and take the gift when it's offered you. So don't you be misled by those who will tell you that it's done, when of all the steps that you must take, you've never taken one. The Bible says we must have faith. Yes, that we must believe if we are to the life we live, we are to receive. Jesus said, confess my name. For I'm the only way. Tell others you believe in me by the way you live each day. When you believe, confess his name and turn from your old sin. Obey the Lord and be baptized. Then live each day for him. Jesus gave his very life on the cross at Calvary. He died, was buried, and rose again, that sinners might be free. Oh, it's true, the gift costs nothing. But when all the facts are weighed, salvation's only free, because the price by Christ was paid. So read your Bible every day. Turn to Jesus when you pray. The price was paid. You cannot pay. The price by Christ was paid. And that's what we're remembering right now when we go to him in our, oh, we call it a ritual sometimes. We call it worship. We call it a lot of things. But God calls it memory. Remember what Jesus did for you and for me. Somebody said that he spilled his blood on Calvary. He didn't spill nothing. That sounds like he made a mistake. Something went wrong. He poured it out gladly. He didn't spill anything. And now when we remember that, the way he taught us to on that last supper 
He said, take this bread, which he broke, and as you break that bread, eat it, remember you're taking my broken body, which I broke for you. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and said, this is my blood, which I shed for you. As oft as you drink it, remember that's where it came from. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Les. As we continue this service, feel free to stand with us. We're going to sing and worship him today just as, um, as we sing, just remember the price he paid for us.
And oh, how high would I climb mountains if the mountains were where you hide? And oh, how far I'd scale the valley if you grace the other side? And oh, how long have I chased rivers from lowly seas to where they rise against the rush of grace descended from the source of its supply. Cause in the highlands and the heartache, you're neither more or less inclined. And I would serve and stop at nothing Cause you're just not that hard to find Oh, I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you when the mountain's in my way You're the summit where my feet are so I'll praise you in the valley all the same. No less God within the shadow. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is. In the highlands and the heartache all the same. Whoa, oh. How far beneath your glory does your kindness extend the path from where your feet rest on the sunrise to where you sweep the sinners past? And oh, how long have sighs to come in if just to shadow me through the night? trace my steps through all my failures and walk me out the other side for who could dare ascend that mountain that valley hill called Calvary but for the one I call good shepherd who like a lamb was slain for me Oh, I will praise you on the mountain. I will praise you when the mountain's in my way. You're the sun and where my feet are. So I'll praise you in the valley all the same. No less God within the shadow. sing through the shadows my song of a sin whatever I walk through wherever I am your name can move mountains wherever I stand if ever I walk through the valley of death I'll sing through the shadows my song of a sin my song of a sin Whoa. My song of a sin. Whoa, whoa, From the gravest of all valleys come the pastures we call grace. 
a mighty river flowing upwards but oh I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you in the mountains in my way you're the sun and where my feet are so I'll praise you in the valley all the same no less God within the shadows no less faithful when the night leads me astray you're the heaven where my heart is in the highlands and the heartache all the same amen amen you guys may be seated this morning we have got a lot going on i thought the stage was being rushed for a minute Whew. i was getting real excited there i'm like this has never happened that's awesome um we've got a lot of stuff going on um here where we can just serve those that God places in our path every week. Um, the uh, the food pantry for the month of April is collecting boxed cereal, and so go ahead and bring that in. I have not touched one box of Lucky Charms in there, I promise you. I was threatened this week. That's one of my favorite cereals. Um, here's the next thing, and this is really cool. I do this every year. Um, Mary Lou is the uh, liaison for Crisis Pregnancy Center here at our church, and they have their Glow Walk coming up. It is Thursday, April 18th. Um, registration begins at 7.30 p.m. Oh, my goodness, that is really late, isn't it? 7.30. I'm already getting ready for second nap at 7.30. I really am. But it's called the Glow Walk, so it kind of has to be dark. So that's why it's at 7.30. It's at the uh, amphitheater um, at at uh, Fairbanks Park. And so here's the deal. Our church, along with a lot of others, supports Crisis Pregnancy Center. And if I can get five people from Berea Christian Church to do this walk with me, with $150 in pledges, you don't have to collect the money. They will collect the money for you. Five people with a $150 pledge from their 40 supporting churches. Anybody doing the math real quick? That will equal their $33,000 goal, and they will exceed that. All right? So I just need four more of you to join me in this walk. But more of you can. That's the greatest thing. Um, there's going to be a great worship band there. Um, so come at 730. Last week was Easter. Our Easter service was absolutely amazing. And here's what I saw that day. So many people were using their gifts and talents that God had given them. From the greeters and the hospitality people welcoming everybody in, uh, Kingdom Kids volunteers, people down there working with our children, giving them a sound uh, base for their Christian beliefs. Uh, the worship group celebrating. Man, that was a celebration time. And then Chris, man, he did like three or four sermons within a few days there. It's an amazing thing. But it requires all of us using our gifts and talents to make it happen so we can bring more people in to know Jesus Christ. All right, so thank you for that. Um, one last thing. Uh, we have Blast Student Ministries tonight. Thank you for that wild applause going on. Yes. Blast Student Ministries tonight, 6 to 7.30. Um, my wife is saying that I should remember God and my girlfriends. Yes, okay, I guessed it. God and my girlfriends, the second Friday of every month. That's going on, all right? And that's this coming Friday. Yes, this coming Friday. Okay, I get my cues from a lot of people in the audience. So, Blast Youth, tonight we're starting a new studies called Why Read the Bible? And we're going to be talking about that for the next few weeks. So, um, if you are a middle school or if you're a, ju a junior high and high school student, please come and join us 6 to 7.30. All right, let's pray. 
Father, we just come to you and we are so thankful for the gifts that you have given us. The gift of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice for us. Father, may we use the gifts and talents that you've given us to serve others, to bring others to know you, because that's why we're here. Father, bless us as we go out today. May it be a day of peace and rest and focus on you. Father, bless us that we would share your love to every person that we meet. Jesus' name, amen. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. The lady that rushed the stage that I told her to come up and remind me, she sat there quietly, very patiently. Debbie has a quick announcement. I'm so forgetful. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Debbie Bondurant. Um, I usually have a baby attached to the front of me. Um, <laughs> My other talent is um, I work with Food Pantry, and along with the food, we have extended our prayer ministry that we are doing with that. So we need volunteers with the food part of it, but I need volunteers to work with me to hand out some information that we give people and to talk with people and pray with people. You can work. Part of the time from 10 to 2, come in, drop in with me as long as you want, as short as you want. Um, I just need some people to work with me to pray with people and talk with people and visit with people and do that stuff. That's all I need. <laughs> anyway, come here, Tony. Uh, just something, I, I was in the back and it's just like, hey, we should do this, but hey, who's supposed to do this? And I was like, oh, hey, there's Tony. She doesn't even know she's doing this yet. Can you see the surprise look on her face? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you get the church email, uh, then you might be aware that on Thursday afternoon, uh, we sent out an update uh, on one of our own, uh, Joe Broyles. Um, wonderful, wonderful man. We love Joe to death and, and his wife, Lynn. Uh, Lynn is kind of our... Our, uh, our go-to prayer person. I think that's a fair way to say that. She is our prayer warrior. Uh, is. I mean, she is extraordinary and, and so devoted and dedicated to that. And so um, as I was standing back there, I was like, hey, she's not here to pray for, to lead that. So um, we want to lift up Joe. He's, he's been diagnosed with cancer and um, it's treatable, but uh, it's going to be a very difficult few months. He's going to be missing. Them. They'll be missing for four months. Uh, from services with us. Uh, if you don't get that email, uh, let me just fill you in on a couple things. Um, they can have visitors. They'll be at home. They can have visitors, uh, but just a couple at a time, and they can't be long stays, just a short short period of time um, together. That's at the request of the doctors with the, the therapy he's going to be going through and things and so uh, with the treatments. So I know some of us love to go and visit and talk with people and talk and talk and talk. No, go, absolutely visit, pray with them, encourage them, we'd love to see you, but we got to keep it short, okay? So just know that that's out there, and so uh, I thought Tony would be the perfect person to come, um, I know her and Lynn have known each other forever at this point, and uh, share that same passion for prayer, and I thought she might be just the perfect person um, to lead that prayer for, for Joe and Lynn and their family, so thank you. Father God, we come before you right now on behalf of your servant, Joseph. Lord, it's been such a blessing to get to know him through the years and his love of service and his love of serving you and helping others come to know you. They've taken people into their homes. They've raised kids that aren't theirs. I, and, and he's taught them in such a beautiful way. Now, Lord, we come to you for him. Father, he still has a lot left in him to give you. And we pray, Lord, that you would just put your healing hand on him. We pray that you would give them strength and endurance because I know the long haul they're in for. All the trips to the oncologist, all of the things that you have to do and observe and be careful of. Give them patience, give them strength, give them peace 
Father God, because they are trusting in you. And we know that your healing hand is upon him. So, Lord, we pray that you would carry them in the palm of your hand like you promised to do and that you will give them the strength and help and guidance we, that they need. And I pray, Lord, that you would use each of us to hold them up in prayer, to remember them daily, and to send notes of encouragement, Lord. And we'll just give you the praise and thanks because we know that when you bring him through this, they're going to be even more powerful for you than they were before. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, seriously, this time you guys are dismissed. All right, have a great day. <laughs>